The, the whole litany of joint actions basically can be done with this joint. It's very flexible. And the reason for that is because the head of the humerus is so big in the glenoid cavity. It's almost like the bone just sitting there on a flat spot. Okay, so as I, as I tear this thing down for you, I like to tell students about what are the general features of synovial joints at this point, and I like to talk about the joint in terms of what keeps it together. I've already mentioned one thing for you about the shoulder, and that was the clavicle keeps it lateral. If you break the clavicle, you pull this thing all the way across to the sternum. Now, the deltoid muscle helps, it actually, because, it's, uh, because of its attachment, helps to hold the head of the humerus. So the deltoid is one piece of this, and now you've learned the deltoid, you've learned the nerve that goes to it, you've learned where it is, now tore it off. Now, underneath the deltoid, we find bursa. You can see one of them is actually called the subdeltoid bursa. These are little bags of fluid that exist in synovial joints. So there are four primary ones. Some books have three because they fuse these two together, the subcorcoid and subscapular. But these are, these are bags of fluid and joints. You find there's about 12 or 13 of them in your knee, and I'm not going to ask you to memorize their names. That is not, I can't see the point of that. Why would you memorize all these bursa names? It's more important for you to see where they are and what they're for. So when we, were learning, when we were learning bones, I said to you, if a bone is pulled on, it grows. In fact, that's why the deltoid tuberosity is there. Because the deltoid has been pulling on that bone, it gets thick there. A thickening, a process on a bone, suggests to you that something's pulling on it. Now I also told you, if you if you rub on a bone, it will stimulate bone inflammation. This was Wolf's Law. Bones remodel and reshape throughout life. So it gets thicker in the places where you put stress on it or if you rub on it. Which means that if a tendon of a muscle rubs on a bone, a bony knot will appear there. And that's going to be a problem for that tendon. So most of the time where there are these critical places where the muscles have to do this over and over again, you'll see bursa. Ways of keeping the tendon from rubbing on the bone. The knee doesn't do that. There's no bursa between the tendon of the quadricep and the knee joint. And so a bone forms there. You know what we call it? The patella. The patella is a kind of friction produced bone. It's a sesamoid bone. But really, um, it is not protected from the rubbing of that tendon. In fact, the tendon attaches to it. It goes across it to attach to the tibial tuberosity. But here we don't do that. In fact, if the subdeltoid bursa was gone, it wouldn't be long before you'd have injury here because the humerus would extend. You'd get a bony spur there extending off the humerus where the deltoid is. So there are bursa in critical places to protect the tendons of the muscles from rubbing on the bones. That is their general um, as a general observation about them. <coughs> okay, so the subdeltoid is a great example of that. Now, <clears throat> the other thing we can see here in this joint is that there's a bunch of um, ligamentous attachments within the joint, and um, they help to stabilize it. But before we do those, I'd like to talk about the muscles that are attached here to stabilize the head of the humerus and teach you their innervations. So these are very famous group of four muscles, deep to the deltoid, their tendons all attached to the proximal end of the humerus, and they are called the muscles of the rotator cuff. And they are the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. These are the four tendons of the rotator cuff muscles. These are the primary stabilizing tendons of the shoulder joint. How do you hold the head of the humerus and the glenoid cavity? With the rotator cuff tendons. That's how it's done. So where are their attachments? You can see here the supraspinatus is attached on the superior and lateral portion. What is the name of that bony piece on the superior and lateral portion of the humerus? Superior and lateral. Superior and lateral. What is the name of that bony piece? Greater two rule. Yeah. So next down. So I'm working my way down posterior, right? And inferior. Working my way down, posterior and inferior. 
The next one is the infraspinatus. Now, you've seen these in the lab already, haven't you? Where is the supraspinatus attached? From here. Where's the other attachment? It's on the greater tubercle. Where is it? It's in the supraspinous fossa of the scapula. Where is the infraspinatus? The infraspinatus. In the infraspinous fossa. Good. Okay. So the last one as I work my way down, posterior and inferior on the greater tubercle, is the teres minor. Now, there is also a muscle called the teres major, but it's not shown here. And it is not considered a rotator cuff muscle. It's not considered a stabilizing muscle of the joint. So we need to look at that in a minute. But first, finish the rotator cuffs. This is supra, infra, teres minor. They're all greater tubercle attachments. Now, where does the teres minor attach? I haven't told you this yet. Uh, the teres minor is attached on the inferior portion of the greater tubercle. So all three of these are on the greater tubercle. Where does it go? From here. So I know where these two go. This one goes good to the lateral board of the scapula. Exactly. Okay. Now the one on the front, this is the only one that supports the front on the anterior side. And the anterior, the anterior projection of the humerus is called the lesser tubercle. And that's where the subscapularis goes. Where is its other piece of attachment? The subscapular fossa. On the subscapular fossa. Where is that on the scapula? Anterior or posterior? Anterior. Anterior. It has an anterior attachment on the scapula, and it has an anterior attachment on the humerus, the subscapularis. It's the only one, really, that protects this joint anteriorly. How many muscles protect the joint inferior? How many protect it in here? Zero. See that? So if you're going to knock the head of the humerus out of the ventoid cavity, which direction does that happen? Down. Exactly. Okay, so you're not going to push it out this way. You're not going to push it up or back. And you're going to have a hard time pushing it forward. But if your arm is abducted and there's a blow to the top of it, it will push the head out. Now, when it does that, when it pushes the head out, and I'm going to emphasize this again here in just a second, pushes the head of the humerus out inferiorly, when that happens, there is a piece of fibro cartilage in here called the ventilated labrum that's oftentimes damaged. Now, one more thing, and we're going to look at those rotator cuff muscles again. Notice here that there is a tendon that passes through the intertubercular groove. That tendon passes through that groove and attaches yeah, you can see it here. It attaches to the rim of the ventral cavity. It is the tendon of the long head of the bicep brachii. That is the muscle that is within the intertubercular groove. Now let me ask you something. How many days do you go without contracting your bicep? None. That does not happen in human experience, right? So the tendon now, the tendon of the bicep, the tendon of the long head of the bicep is in the groove. And every time you flex at the elbow, that tendon has to slide in that groove. If it does that on the groove, what's going to happen to the groove? Right. It won't be long before the groove ossifies and is a flat surface, maybe even a process. And then where's the tendon going to be? It's not going to be in that groove anymore, right? Okay, so if you had to guess then, what would you guess about the tendon of the long head? It's not shown here. Yeah, you better find a bursa there, right? So here's a picture of it. I have a couple pictures. There it is right here, and we'll come back to it in a minute. You see the green bursa around it? There's a tendon sheath around that tendon to protect the intertubercular groove from the rubbing of the tendon of the long head of the bicep. All right, now let's do the rotator cuff muscles again. So I tore the deltoid off, the supraspinatus here. The infraspinatus here, the teres minor, the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor. Now notice, the teres minor gets axillary just like the deltoid does. Can you walk me back already? Just think about it with me. Axillary gets all three, well it gets posterior cord, it gets all three posterior divisions, it gets all three trunks, it gets all of the Roots, right? Roots, trunks, divisions, cords. A great example here. Teres minor gets axillary like the deltoid does. The infraspinatus and supraspinatus gets suprascapular. You haven't seen that one yet. Here it is. So here are the suprascapular 
uh, sorry, here is the super <laughs> scapular nerve right here. And so let's, you, you can help me with these descriptions. Where does the super scapular nerve come from? The dorsal scapular goes to the levator and rhomboids. It's really at the edge of the brachial plexus. Where does the super scapular come from? If it's a supra, it's on top. Yeah? If it's supra, it's on top. So where does it come from? Okay, it comes from the upper trunk. You see that? It comes from the upper trunk. Is it really part of the plexus? It's not really part of the plexus. So the first two you've learned are not really technically part of it. Now. Um, in my defense, I have already taught you axillary. Okay, so you know something about the plexus. But these two, the dorsal scapular and the suprascapular, are really not part of the plexus. The dorsal scapular comes off C3, C4, C5, depending on the muscle group, and the suprascapular comes off of the upper trunk. Now, what divisions of the spinal cord does the upper trunk get? What divisions do the upper trunk get? Upper trunk gets five and six. Okay, so just because I said upper trunk is not all the information that you need, right? So the suprascapular is upper trunk in five and six to supply the supraspinatus. To supply the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Now the other rotator cuff muscle is the subscapularis that you told me already it goes from the subscapular to the um, lesser tubercle. It's the one on the front, and it gets subscapular nerve. Okay, so that makes good sense. I like the names here, but where's the subscapular nerve? So there's a couple of them here. So can you describe for me the subscapular nerves? Where do they come from? Okay, so we'll just do the closest piece of the plexus in each of these cases. Just the closest piece of the plexus. The suprascapular comes off the upper trunk. The subscapulars come off of the posterior cord. Okay, so it's getting worse. I'm just telling you, this is getting worse. The dorsal scapular comes right off of the spinal segments. The suprascapular comes off of a trunk, and now we're off of a cord. Now, if you've got your little picture drawn, <laughs> if you've got your little picture drawn on your test, then you won't have any trouble with these kinds of questions. And you can just remember one fact. These come off of the ventral rami, are the roots. These come off of the trunk. So dorsal scapular, suprascapular, subscapular. You all see how I'm organizing this? I'm getting further down into the plexus. The dorsal scapular off of the roots, the suprascapular off of the trunk, and now the subscapular, which means the subscapularis, comes off of the posterior cord. Now the posterior cord is going to feed the radial axillary nerves, and the posterior cord is going to get information from the posterior divisions of all three trunks. Are y'all following? This is what we mean by the nightmare of the brachial plexus. Okay, so the subscapular nerves come off the posterior cord. Now, the shoulder joint, as I said, is supported, it is supported in fact by the deltoid. And you know, can y'all do it with me? Don't be in too big a hurry, right? It is supported by the deltoid. The deltoid is attached to the deltoid muscle. is attached to the deltoid tuberosity. And where is it attached on the shoulder? The clavicle. The clavicle. The, the spine. Yes, yeah, big shoulder muscle. It does abduction. And is there a bursa that protects it? Its name? So deltoid bursa, you know what the function there is, all right? You get the deltoid off, we see the muscles of the rotator cuff. Can you name them from top to bottom? On the posterior lateral border. Supra. Supra. Interspinatus. Teres minor. What's the one on the front? Subscapularis. Okay. Now, that's all gone. And I have now pulled the humerus off so you can see what's in here. You can see, for one thing, you can see the tendon of the long head of the bicep here attaching to the rim of the glenoid cavity. In this picture here, what is missing? Yeah, a tendon sheath around this tendon. 
Now this tendon, this tendon comes across the anterior side of the humerus now and runs down the intertubercular groove. So do you see how this tendon is actually supporting the joint? It actually helps hold, it actually helps hold the head of the humerus down. Now another feature that helps hold the head of the humerus down here is this labrum right here, uh, called the glenoid labrum. There's a labrum in your shoulder and there's one in your hip. This one's called glenoid, the one in your hip is called the acetabular labrum. Yeah, where the head of the femur is and the acetabular. Now, notice the cartoon picture here is intended to teach you that the edges of the labrum are thicker than the center. This is a support for the joint. It helps hold the head of the humerus in there. Now, which way does shoulder dislocation happen, if it happens? All right, this is a piece of fibrocartilage, the labrum. Do pieces of fibrocartilage heal well? They do not. If a shoulder is dislocated, where is the labrum entry? If a shoulder is dislocated, where is the labrum entry most of the time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the head of the humerus sits in this little pocket here, and if the shoulder is abducted, and you drive the head of the humerus out, where is the entry going to be? Along the inferior margin of the labrum. That is most of the time where, and these are fibrocardic injuries, that's the end of the pitcher's career right there a labrum tear on the bottom of the glenoid cavity. All right. Now, since we did the bicep, uh, let's go back and do one more. Right here in the shoulder. Not finished yet. Okay. So notice, um, there are bursa here, the tin of the long head. Um, we talked about the glenoid labrum here. And now, um, some of you, I hope, will be wondering, if I point it out to you at least, how does the tendon of the long head stay in there? Well, it could be the groove is deep enough so it just stays, but it, it's safer than that, actually. Because there is a staple that keeps the tendon of that long head in place called the transverse humeral retinaculum. You do not see tendons of the long heads of the bicep coming out of this groove. You will see, on occasion, the most horrific, one of the most horrific looking injuries possible, a tear of this tendon. Yeah. It does not come out of the, of, the, of the groove, but if it's torn, then you can see the muscle, this tendon will slide out from under the transverse humeral retinaculum, and it will ball up in the person's arm. It's a horrible looking injury. But it stays in there as long as it's not torn because of that retinaculum. Now, you can also see that there are a number of ligaments attached from bone to bone. Now, you don't need to memorize these, right? You don't need to memorize these. Because they're named for the bones they go to and from. But you need to know the name of the ligament that helps hold the shoulder together. Which one is that? Mm -hmm. Of these four. The coracoidal. Uh -huh. Yeah, this one goes from the coracoid process to the clavicle. To the coronary tubercle. Oh, not that one. This one, the acromial clavicular, goes from the acromion to the clavicle. This one goes from the coracoid process to the acromion. Are any of those helping hold the shoulder in place? This one is, though the coracoid process to the humerus. Now this is an important thing. This will be an exam question as well. The coracoid process, and this is an important spot. The coracoid process on the scapula. This is a really important spot. There's bursa right underneath it to protect it, to protect the subscapularis from rubbing on it. There is one of the heads of the bicep there. There is a muscle that you've already found in the lab that goes right over to the uh, proximal of the humerus called the cracobrachialis. The pectoralis minor is there, and there's a ligament there that attaches to the head of the humerus to hold the humerus in place, called the cracohumeral ligament. This is a really important piece of your shoulder, the coracoid process. Now, not shown on this picture, there are three ligaments, glenohumeral ligaments, that are actually um, 
that actually go directly from the glenoid cavity to the head of the humerus to hold this thing in place. So let's make a list. In my shoulder, what holds it together? Deltoid, you can explain. The four muscles of the rotator cuff, you can attach them, explain them and their innervations. The long head of the tendon, the long head of the bicep tendon, you can explain its attachment, how it's held in place. The glenoid labrum, the coracohumeral ligament, and the glenohumeral ligaments. Uh, think somebody had in mind to help hold this thing together? I mean, it's incredibly mobile, but you don't hear about normal people having shoulder dislocations. You got to do something significant, even though the head of the humerus doesn't look like um, it's sitting in there securely. It's actually quite stable and quite mobile with all of these incredible, um, sophisticated attachments. All right, did that. All right, now, when we pick up next time, I did the shoulder here. I'm gonna do the bicep here before I work my way around the chest. So I'm a little bit behind you in the lab. Um, tomorrow's lab is intended to be... The plexus. What? The plexus. The plexus is beyond the nerve stuff. Okay, so you have a little introduction to that. And then, it um, won't be long before we're going to be thinking about another lab exam, right? How far away we do that? It's, isn't it like after, after we come back from break? Okay, so, um, so I'm going to be working through this with all these attachments. And by the time your lab exam gets here, I'm going to be close to having covered all the muscles that you found in the lab and their innervations. So, the idea here is to keep this on track. I'm a little bit behind in lecture, so I'll talk faster on Friday.